Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. So great to see so many folks here joining us today. My name is Sue Staniforth, and I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator with the Invasive Species Council of BC. I am lucky to live and work in the traditional territory of the Comox First Nation here on Vancouver Island. Thanks to everybody for joining today for the webinar. It's called Fall Harvesting and Invasive Species. This is a very seasonal topic, obviously. And uh, for those of you who may be out harvesting today and can't join us, the webinar is being recorded and a PDF will also be available. This webinar today is being presented by Willie Pohl um, and she's the Indigenous Liaison with the Invasive Species Council of BC, as well as Adrian Clark, who's the Vice President of Science with the Freshwater Fisheries Society of BC. Willie will be talking about some of the harvesting activities that happen in BC at this time of year and how harvesting activities might increase the spread of invasive species. Adrian will talk fishing. He'll profile some of the invasive fish in BC, how they impact native fisheries, and provide a current update on whirling disease. Their lab has been ass assessing fish samples across BC since 2016. I hope everybody had a chance to sign in early and get any technical problems worked out. If you're still experiencing any problems, write a note in the chat box and we'll see if we can assist you. Everybody's been muted, so you should only able, be able to hear myself and the presenters. If you have a question during the presentation, please type it into the chat box and we'll see if we can get to the, get the, the questions at the end of the presentation. The chat box you'll see at the right hand side of your screen. If we run out of time to address all of your questions, we'll send out the questions and answers by email. To begin with, we'd like to find out who's here and where you all work or what your areas of interest are. If you haven't already, can you please type in your name and workplace or your area of interest in the chat box? And we can re review these while I'm introducing Willie and Adrian. Thank you. All right, so at this point, I'm pleased to give a warm welcome and introduction to Willie Pohl, who's the Indigenous Liaison with the ISCBC. Willie is an Anishinaabe Quay, originally from Northern Ontario, but now based in Pemberton and loving the beauty of British Columbia. Willie is passionate about protecting BC's environment and loves being out in nature. She has worked with multiple First Nations to build land-based and hunting programs for youth across Canada's North. Willie holds a BA in Indigenous Studies from Laurentian University and a Master's of Arts in Archaeology from the University of Chester in England. Willie's presentation today will focus on some of the harvesting activities that happen in BC at this time of the year, including berry picking, hunting, fishing and camping. We'll also look at ways that invasive species may impact the species that we harvest, how our activities might increase their spread and ways to prevent this. Adrian will profile some of the invasive fish in BC, how they impact native fisheries and provide a current update on whirling disease. Their lab, as I said, has been assessing fish samples since 2016. So at this point, I'm gonna pass the microphone over to you, Willie. I hope everybody enjoys the webinar. Hello. <laughs> Give me one second, I'm just gonna put the slideshow up. Okay, Ani Bojo, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, Sue, for that lovely introduction. Uh, as you said, Indigenous Cost Willie, my name is Willie. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I am speaking from the unceded lands of the Lilwat Nation, now known as Pemberton. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert on invasive species, as you said, my background is in land-based education, uh, a lot of which has revolved around taking youth hunting and working with knowledge keepers and elders to better understand the environment around us and the changes that are happening so that we can better protect our lands. Okay, so this is just a sort of a draft of what we're gonna go through. 
So I'm just going to move right through to who we are. Firstly, I'd like to introduce our organization. The Invasive Species Council of BC is a registered charity and not-for-profit society that helps to coordinate, unite a wide variety of concerned stakeholders in the struggle against invasive species in BC. We are action-oriented and aim to build healthy landscapes across the province, create outreach and educational materials, create training opportunities, and conduct research around invasive species management and stopping the spread of invasives. Our organization thrives off partnerships, and thus far we've worked with over 100 First Nations across BC, as well as various local municipalities and industry partners to help stop the spread. We work virtually from across BC. Our team is very diverse with many different skills, all of which have the same passion for protecting BC's natural environment. Okay, so I'll just do a quick introduction about what invasive species are. Invasive species are non-native species that cause major environmental, economic, and social impacts. Not all non-native species are invasive. For example, many of the plant species we enjoy as food do not thrive outside of our gardens, or if you're like me, they rarely survive in the garden. Non-native does not always mean bad for the environment, but invasive does. Okay, so what are the characteristics of invasives? <clears throat> uh, so invasive species often have similar characteristics, which allows them to cause the havoc that they do. Firstly, they're often prolific seed producers and reproducers. For example, purple loosestrife can produce over 300,000 seeds per year. Secondly, they spread easily. For example, hound's tongue has burrs that can often attach to animals, vehicles, and clothing to hitch a ride to new places. Uh, thirdly, they can establish quickly and thrive. Invasive species often outgrow other plant species and can take over an area very quickly. They're exceptionally hardy. For example, tansy ragwort can sprout from roots, root pieces, and crown buds, giving them quite the success rate. Uh, and lastly, they often lack natural predators or pathogens. This means that most livestock do not graze on invasive species, leaving nothing to manage them in the wild. Uh, environmental impact. So for most of my life, I've heard stories about plants. A lot of these stories are beautiful stories of living beings that thrive from plant and human connection. Plants hold cures for all kinds of ailments and they hold the nutrients we need to survive. So going into invasive species management was difficult for me as it kind of went against my own mindset. For me, it was crucial to understand that in their native homes, these plants are not so negative, but that they don't really belong here. Here is where they are causing devastating impacts and one of the greatest threats to biodiversity. Within the environment, I've always been taught an interconnected approach but often invasive species have been completely overlooked. Yet their impacts are huge, such as the spotted knapweed in Glacier National Park that now has eliminated seven rare and uncommon plant species in only three years. So here are some facts about BC's biodiversity. With BC housing 60% of Canada's plant species and 72% of Canada's land mammal species, it's crucial that we want to fight to protect it. Um, being from Northern Ontario, it's also a very beautiful spot, but I will say that BC is just the most beautiful place I think I've ever seen. Um, I've lived all over Canada's North. I love the North, I love their lights, um, but BC is just so beautiful. <laughs> um, Social impacts. So indigenous people in Canada are already fighting for land sovereignty and food sovereignty, although that's probably a whole other webinar. <laughs> uh, through colonization, indigenous people have had to change their diet drastically and has had some devastating health effects. Right now we're in a time of change where indigenous people are winning land rights back and taking huge leaps in environmental conservation and reclaiming their traditions that were stolen. With all these things, invasives are connected. We'll talk a little bit later about how invasives are affecting indigenous foods and medicines, but I think it's key that we take a more indigenized approach to land conservation 
and see that the interconnectedness. Working in land-based education, I often hear things like, wolves are the sole reason for the declining moose population or that climate change is the sole reason for our environment's decay. These things are all connected and invasives definitely need to become part of the conversation discussion because it is causing drastic social impacts to indigenous communities. So economic impacts, invasive species are expensive. Let's see if anybody can guess the annual impact of invasive species in Canada. And you can just put your guesses up in the chat box and we'll see who, if anyone's close. We got a few guesses coming in, Willie. Uh, 15 million from William, uh, 1 billion from Virginia, 10 million from Murray, 72 million from C Colleen, Loretta says 5 million, Natasha says 5 million. Hmm. Let's see. So 30 billion, um, and this study was actually done from 2014, so it could be even higher. So invasive species are expensive. How do invasive species get here? Uh, invasive species are brought here a variety of ways. One is through the horticulture industry. For example, Japanese knotweed was prized for its size and beautiful leaves and that's brought here without knowing its devastating effects. Uh, European starling was brought here in the 1890s simply by a Shakespeare enthusiast. Once invasive species are here, we tend to spread them around. Boats, shipping materials, in crops, seed mixes, Fortunately, the more aware we are, the more we can do to prevent their spread. Um, so these are some zebra mussels, not yet in BC and hopefully never will be, because um, you can see how devastating they are. And yes, burrs on a dog. <laughs> I'm sure we've all had that uh, situation. I know my dog has had tons. Okay, so fall harvesting. What are some fall harvesting activities? We're so lucky in BC to have the amazing biodiversity that we have, and many communities rely on the harvest of plants and animals. Often hunting and medicine picking is done in more remote, pristine areas, and so it's even more important to ensure that we're not allowing invasive species into these areas. Berry picking. One of the most common berries picked is soap berries and salmon berries, although salmon berries are harvested more so in the spring. Um, these berries are both edible, although I've had Indian ice cream and I don't love it. <laughs> it's quite bitter um, and have been a strong food source for many Indigenous people. Unfortunately, in many cases, invasive species are threatening them. Invasive blackberry can grow over the berry bushes and limit their growth from blocking out the sunlight, as well as prevent us from being able to harvest them. Soapberry can be displaced by butterfly bush and common tansy, both of which grow rapidly and outcompete the native species. Knotweeds are also very aggressive invasive species that grow in the same areas and conditions as salmonberry and can often outcompete the native plant. Blackberries. Blackberries are very popular and also delicious. However, not all of our blackberry plants are a native species. Himalayan blackberry is very invasive and as seen before, can essentially smother other plants. Although we wanna continue harvesting blackberries, we also want to ensure that we're managing them and ensuring that they're not causing harm to our native species. Our native species of blackberry is trailing blackberry. It's actually much, much smaller, um, lower the ground and the the uh, stems aren't nearly as thick. Uh, sage is a very strong medicine that's hugely important to Indigenous people. I know from my own experience in culture as Anishinaabe, 
Uh, we use it in part for almost every ceremony. Um, unfortunately, rush skeleton, knapweeds, and cheatgrass love dry and arid areas where sage grows, and they can grow a lot faster and end up overpowering sage. Sage also has a very lovely smell. It's one of my favorite. Western red and yellow cedar. Uh, cedar has always been a very powerful medicine. It makes a really great and lovely smelling tea. Trees and plants of this size can be devastated by invasive species, such as English ivy that grows aggressively over the tree and smothers it. And also the seedlings when they're small can be impacted by invasive species such as scotch broom, knapweed, and gorse. Deer and moose, a key source of food for many communities. Um, recently, I found a really cool study that showed that deer have a preference for eating native plants and that even when they're put with invasive plants that are fully edible, the deer choose to eat the native plants. For me, this really showed how the animals have their own knowledge about the environment and just how much we can learn by watching them, but it also creates a bit of a problem. This means that even the invasives that are edible are being eaten as a last resort, meaning our native species is being kept in check, but the invasives are actually given more of an advantage and are allowed to grow rapidly and fiercely. In the realm of seeing environment as interconnected, we also understand that the animals who rely on those native species and don't have the option to eat invasives won't be able to get enough food as the deer feed on them and the invasives will continue to push the native species out. I believe that study was on, um, I'll link it after the presentation, but I believe it was on white-tailed deer and it was done in Michigan. Um, so it'd be really interesting to see if there's similar research here. Um, in conclusion of all these points, I really wanna push that awareness is key. Hunters, medicine and berry pickers, and people who are out in nature most will be able to see invasives and their impacts the most. That often we use the same areas to harvest and that it's crucial con to continue to monitor these sites so that we don't lose them. Listening to our traditional knowledge keepers and elders speak about change in the environment is important. And with more invasives education, we may be able to link together some of the changes and include invasive species in the discourse for environmental protection. Working in conservation and land-based education, education with Indigenous communities, I always listen closely to the traditional ecological knowledge of those areas. And often we hear about things like overfishing, overhunting, too many predators, climate change, changing migration routes, but rarely are invasive species mentioned. And so we need to continue to be the eyes on the ground and be vigilant that invasive species are a real threat to Indigenous ways of being and to the environment as a whole. Um, on that note, I would like to hand the presentation back to Sue Staniforth to introduce our very exciting guest speaker. But thank you very much, and I will be back with you soon. Great. Thank you, Willie. Thanks for that presentation. We'll hear back to you um, uh, in a minute. Um, I'm really delighted to have with us Adrian Clark, who's the Vice President of Science with the Freshwater Fisheries Society of BC. Adrian's joining us today from Victoria. And um, Adrian spent 10 years as a commercial fisherman before going back to school and atten attaining his BSc in fisheries biology and an MSc in natural resources and environmental studies. He's worked with the Freshwater Fisheries Society since 2007 and is currently the VP of Science and a member of the Society's senior management team. The focus of Adrian's work includes leading several business areas for the Society, including fish health services, research and evaluation and outreach, with the overall goal of enhancing and conserving the freshwater fisheries resources of BC for the benefits of the public. Adrian also manages funding for the Small Lakes Management and Conservation Initiative, this one aims to improve the management of small lake fisheries while protecting wild fish populations. Funds for this program come from angling licenses, another good reason to buy your fishing license. I'll pass the mic over to you now, Adrian, and thanks so much for joining us.
Thank you, sir. And a uh, pleasure pleasure to be here today. Um, I'll just pull up the presentation. Is that working for everybody? Not yet, but give it a minute. It should should come come up. Still not seeing Adrian. Maybe stop sharing and start again. Yeah, it's giving me a panel that wasn't coming up earlier. It's saying only hosts can share. So something got turned off or changed. All right, we can we can address that. I think I've got it now. All right, good. Sorry, everybody. So I hope that's working. That's great. Thank you. Great. Uh, so yeah, like I said, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate um, uh, being with everybody today. This is actually, I, I do a lot of presentations, but this is my first webinar, so it's a, a different experience. So I briefly wanted to talk to everybody today about uh, invasive species, uh, fish in particular, and whirling disease uh, in British Columbia. Um, that's a perspective from the Freshwater Fisheries Society. So uh, briefly, I just wanted to mention who we are. Um, so we are a nonprofit. We were created in 2003. And prior to that, we were a, a portion of the uh, provincial government, the Ministry of Water, Land, and Air Protection. And uh, we were taken out of government as a nonprofit model um, to deliver services. So we have a 30 year service agreement. Um, uh, the main function that we have is to rear and release fish into approximately 800 stock lakes in the province. Uh, we also do conservation fish culture of white sturgeon in both the Columbia Rivers and the Nechaco River. We have uh, a fairly a reasonably sized research and development group. Um, we do marketing and outreach. And I think one of our really interesting initiatives uh, that helps educate people on invasive species, as well as uh, fishing ethics and teaches kids how to, how to fish is our Learn to Fish program. And we've currently put 310,000 families and children through that um, through that program. So the freshwater fishing experience in BC, essentially around 350,000 people buy fishing licenses every year to recreationally fish in freshwater. Um, that's equivalent to about $500 million in direct revenue for the provincial economy. A variety, variety number of fishing experiences, anything from kind of your put and take rural or sorry, urban lakes, uh, remote wilderness fishing and rivers, uh, large lake fisheries for fish like large body rainbow trout, um, bull trout and lake char, um, and chance to fish in one of the approximately 800 lakes that we stock across the province. And the little map in the sidebar sort of gives a, a general description of where the, the lakes are located. Definitely over the province with fewer in the, in the north, more northern areas. And then, of course, the other type of fishing um, that people enjoy in the province from a recreational perspective is ice fishing. So in invasive freshwater fish in BC, uh, what is an invasive freshwater fish? Essentially, it's a fish that is not native to a water body in the province, a lake, stream, or watershed in which it's now present. So they spread very rapidly, and they tend to outcompete and prey on native species. And they also alter the aquatic environment, which has uh, negative impacts on both the environment and the economy. So some of the impacts and how these fish uh, are impactful to fish in, in ecosystems, definitely through predation, uh, competition, displacement, and hybridization. They disrupt, alter, and destroy habitats, food webs, and aquatic communities. And they can also introduce foreign diseases, depending on where they have been moved from. So these figures essentially depict the change in invasive species since the, since the, around 1900 all the way through to 2014. Essentially, there were, there were no invasive species. Um, the first few occurrences were actually intentionally uh, stocked fish by the provincial government and the federal government at the time. Um, and now we have approximately 30 invasive freshwater fish species in the province. 
So which invasive fish are now in BC? Uh, there's, as I said, there's 30. Um, some of the more prominent fish are common goldfish, uh, carp, smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, uh, pike, um, mainly in the Columbia system. Uh, as one of the participants in the call mentioned on the chat, uh, pike are native to north, northeastern BC. Um, pumpkin seeds, bluegill, crappie, brown bullheads, yellow perch, um, all kinds of um, invasive species. Uh, most either introduced by misguided anglers or pet owners. So as I mentioned, how do fish get into BC waters? Uh, people are the number one reason, um, intentional or not. Uh, most confirmed locations of invasive fish in BC are due to unauthorized transfers and introductions into water bodies. Um, unfortunately, some anglers do desire non-native species such as bass um, for fisheries uh, that I think we think they're more accustomed to them where they come from. So, you know, an Ontario angler might decide that he wants to fish for a large bass in British Columbia. And uh, one example of uh, why the bucket brigade, bucket brigade happens. Um, goldfish get released uh, both intentionally and accidentally. I know a number, a couple of the lakes uh, more recently in BC that have goldfish in them. They think it was due to flooded goldfish ponds that the fish actually just flooded into the lake and goldfish create massive issues um, for the province. There's a few other reasons, um, religious practices. Um, there's some religions believe releasing a fish or an animal to water body brings them good luck. Discarded food, accidental transfers and boating and other, rec other related sports equipment um, processes like that. So how impactful are our invasive fish to native fisheries? Um, BC has an incredible diversity of native fish and, and, a, and a wonderful uh, freshwater fishing um, industry. Uh, the main native species that we, we angle for are trout, char, and kokanee, but there's also burbot, walleye, and sturgeon. And they're all locally adapted to their environment. Uh, when a non-native species is released into the environment, significant negative impacts can and do occur, um, mainly because the ecosystems and the native species are naive to these new species and sometimes the diseases they bring with them. Uh, where sports species like bass are introduced by misguided anglers, they can have unpredictable outcomes, including destroying fisheries for native species and replacing them with poorly performing fisheries for stunted, overpopulated uh, invasive species. So when I mentioned stunted, uh, fish like bass and perch, they tend to attain a very small body form and they, they end up being a high density in, in a lot of the environments that they invade compared to their native environments. So some of the things we can do if we see an aquatic invasive species, uh, you can download the app from the BC government site and report it through that. And if you witness anybody moving fish um, illegally or a suspected illegal movement, it's good to phone the uh, report all poachers and polluters line um, and report the observation that you see. So I briefly wanted to move on from fish and just quickly talk about whirling disease. Um, whirling disease isn't a problem in British Columbia yet, but we're certainly on high alert for it given its proximity in Alberta. Um, whirling disease is caused by a microscopic parasite that affects salmonids. Some species like rainbow and cutthroat trout are, are very susceptible to the disease, uh, while other fish, um, the anatomous salmonids, uh, things like bull trout, lake trout, they can get infected, but they seem to be asymptomatic for the most part when it comes to growing disease. Severity certainly depends on fish size and age. Young fish are very vulnerable um, and the population can experience up to 90% uh, mortality. Um, as fish get older, whirling disease doesn't tend to affect the older age classes. Infected fish have a very characteristic whirling swimming pattern. And so if you observe that, it's, it's good to, uh, to report that. Um, Essentially, the parasite invades the cartilage and damages the nervous system and creates skeletal de deformities. Um, you often see a blackened tail, which um, sometimes can be mistaken for um, a, sampling, a sampling issue, but it's uh, things look out for a crooked tail, sunken head, and the blackened tail. As I mentioned before, some, some fish are asymptomatic, so they don't necessarily all show symptoms. The parasite has quite a complex life cycle. It involves both the fish and tube effects worms as hosts. So a form of the parasite is typically released by the worm into the water column, where it then attaches to the fish, um, gets into the nervous system, and then gets into the cartilage. 
there are no health concerns for humans, but certainly there's major impacts on fisheries. Uh, similar to every other invasive species, they can be spread naturally, accidentally uh, by humans through movement of dead or live fish, um, the infected worms themselves, or contaminated equipment or water. So just a few example pictures of what you might see um, in the field. Uh, the, top, the top individual is a, is a normal looking rainbow trout. The fish in the middle is a very characteristic sign where the, where the fish has already become deformed, deformed from the parasite getting into the cartilage. And then the, the lower picture showing the black and tail um, characteristic of whirling disease. So the basic timeline uh, for whirling disease, uh, and again, we don't, as far as we know, have whirling disease in British Columbia. Um, first detection was in 1956 in Pennsylvania. In the 60s, it was mostly found in the northeastern states. 1990s, it was moving west, first found in four hatcheries in the Midwestern states, and it became a real problem um, in Colorado and Montana for some, some really key trout fisheries. In 2016, the first confirmation in Johnson Lake in Alberta, um, which is, a, which is a, the headwaters of the Bull River, was first confirmed in Canada. So since 2017, we, we uh, the province and CFA have been testing um, fish quite actively. Uh, so far, we haven't seen uh, any locations or any fish in locations we've sampled. Um, actually, the next slide, I'm gonna to get to that more specifically, but um, essentially a number of Alberta locations have now been affected with whirling disease, which is causing some major issues for um, the fish management team there. So as I indicated, uh, we've been sampling since 2016, um, focusing on sort of the, the eastern part of BC, uh, next to the Alberta border, uh, looking at all of our broodstock lakes that we utilize for our fish culture activities, and then any other potential um, identification of people that were sus had suspect observations. Um, and more recently, we've actually been testing the tube effects worms uh, as a technique was developed by the Alberta government to look at um, if they could recognize whirling disease through the worms. And so far, as I indicated, all the results in BC have been negative to date. Um, that being said, we've only tested a, a fraction of the water bodies in the province. Some of the things you can do to help prevent whirling disease in BC, um, it is untreatable, so it's best to, to prevent um, it coming into the province if possible. Uh, everybody should clean, drain, and dry their equipment. Um, boating gear, boats, boots, uh, ensure all the water is always drained from a boat. And this isn't just whirling disease, this is um, uh, invasive mussels as well. And try to really disinfect equipment, particularly if you're gonna be moving between water bodies. Uh, decontamination protocols, uh, certainly our staff all use them, the government staff use them. I believe uh, other consulting agencies have adopted the protocols. Um, we use prox uh, proxy, uh, uh, something called peroxide, so um, it's, or it's a peroxide derivative. Uh, other groups use very hot water. I think it has to be above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, you can use a bleach solution. Uh, when cleaning and gutting fish, um, it is acceptable to put fish parts back into the water body from which the fish were caught, um, preferably trying to get them into the deep water so they don't cause any wildlife interactions with people. Alternatively, Putting entrails in the garbage is great. Um, the main concern is not to transfer fish, live or dead, between water bodies. Um, that's probably the biggest risk um, from fishing activities that we can that we can try to avoid. Um, it's also a good idea to avoid using thin fish for bait. For the most part, this is illegal, uh, regardless of BC. There are a few exceptions. Um, Whirling disease is reportable to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, so if you do suspect an occurrence, it has to be reported. CFIA. If people are interested, there is a link to a blog that um, I'm sure Sue could share after uh, that, that my staff put together about whirling disease. And um, there's also uh, other interesting material you know, on that site if people are interested. So I hope I didn't move to that too quickly, um, but I'm happy to take questions if, if there are some. 
Great, thanks so much, Adrian. That was a great presentation. We're gonna act, ask people to hold uh, their questions. Well, please, please type your questions into the chat box. I see there's a couple coming in, but um, I'm gonna ask Willie to come back and just um, do some summary uh, uh, slides and statements. And then once um, Willie's completed, um, we can get to the questions. So please type your questions into the chat box for either Willie or Adrian. And I'll hand this back over to Willie. Hello. Sorry, just bear with me while I set this up for one second. Um, okay, and thank you so much, Adrian. Um, I'm just gonna wrap up with a few actions that we can all take to stop the spread of invasive species. Uh, so as Adrian said, we have clean, drain, dry. We also have plain, clean, go, don't move firewood, buy it where you burn it. So clean, drain, dry is a program that targets boaters of all types. I won't spend too much on it, as I know Adrian mentioned it. Um, the goal is to stop the spread of aquatic invasive species from being introduced or spread between bodies of water. Uh, it's almost impossible to get rid of aquatic invasives once they get established in a body of water. So it's crucial that we clean everything off our boats, including kayaks and paddle boards, which often get ignored, and any gear that was used in the water. Drain all the water and gear onto land, and then dry the boat and gear completely before putting it into a new body of water. So my, I'm gonna say my favorite invasive species um, are those invasive mussels because it's just so alarming. If I was to pick one thing that just really terrifies me, it's looking at all of those mussels on the boat motor. <laughs> so play, clean, go. Uh, this is a similar program, but aimed at land recreationalists such as those who like to harvest wild foods, hikers, mountain bikers, dog walkers, ATVers, and horse enthusiasts. So the idea is to ensure that you clean all of your equipment, check your boots, check your pets, check your quads, tires, mud flaps, make sure all the mud, grass, and dirt is cleaned off of your equipment and pets so that we are not unknowingly transporting these hitchhikers to new places. Um, especially when we're going into really pristine places um, to hunt or medicine pick that we definitely do not want invasives there. Okay, firewood. Moving firewood can spread invasive species and diseases. Species forests are threatened by non-native insects that can damage large numbers of trees. New infestations of these invasives are often first found in campgrounds and parks. So please buy your firewood local or near your destination so that you aren't moving invasives. If you accidentally bring any non-local wood, burn it first and burn it completely. And lastly, if you have wood left over, leave it there for the next people and avoid bringing it with you. So here are two examples of introduced insects on firewood, the Asian longhorn beetle and the gypsy moth. Although transporting firewood may seem like an easy way to save money, it can have devastating effects on the environment. If you see an invasive species, report it. You can do this on the Report Invasives app. It's free to download for iPhone and Android and also works as a great field guide when you're out harvesting as well. Uh, it's really easy to use and can also be used out of cell range as it will save your photo and report it when back in range. This way you can easily and quickly report something and an invasive species expert will receive the reports and check them out. This is crucial. Um, we definitely don't have enough people reporting invasives to to give us the data we need to know where invasives are and of what numbers. Um, working in education, this is definitely something that I do with students. Um, so all my students have this app and it works really well in education as well. Um, so I guess in summary, I just wanna push the fact that our harvesting areas are pristine and so, so valued. 
We want to continue to protect them. We want the public to be aware of invasive species and watch for them so that BC's wildlife can thrive. Follow the key guidelines and together we can help protect BC so that generations in future can continue berry picking, hunting, and all that great stuff out on the land. Okay, so thank you so much for listening. Um, I'm not an invasive expert, but I will hand it back to Sue and we can hopefully take some questions. All right, great. Thank you so much, Willie, and thank you, Adrian, for those excellent presentations. So we have some questions being entered into the chat box. So we'll go through them one by one and go right till one o'clock. So folks, please write your questions in the, in the chat and um, I'll start off. So um, this is a question for Adrian from Celeste. Um, and Celeste is asking, are there conditions that predispose fish to being more vulnerable to whirling disease? I said, I mean, myself. That's uh, a good question, to be honest. Not that I'm aware of. I think it's more that some species are more susceptible to whirling disease than others, uh, such as rainbow and cutthroat and whitefish, I believe, are the three species that are most susceptible. So I think if whirling disease is present in the environment where those fish um, where those fish exist, I think that, that would be the, the predisposition would just be the species. Again, I'm not going to say that I'm an expert either. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert. <laughs> All right, perfect. Um, I have a question again along those lines, Adrian, around whirling disease. Is, are, is there treatment available? Like if, if there are fish that are um, affected, is there anything that people can do? No, there's no treatment. Um, I think what they found in Colorado, Montana with the fisheries, I believe it took about 10 years for the fisheries to even start rebounding. I think fish over time um, build up, build up uh, the capability to to, to sustain themselves as a population, but it takes quite a long time. All right. All right, question. I also know that there's a Q&A box. So there's two places you can um, add your questions to folks. So I'll, I'll finish off the, um, the ones in the chat and I'll go to the Q&A. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so Loretta, hi Loretta Holmes. She's um, asking about harvesting an invasive species. She um, is struggling, um, as the Upper Nicola Band is, as I know well, is battling a real invasion of yellow perch in Douglas Lake with burbot, burbot, burbot and I'm not sure how to say that um, indigenous name, I think it's squillic season approaching. Is Adrian aware of yellow perch behavior and habitat preferences on iced over lakes? For example, would they compete for food with burbot or would they be the food? <laughs> She says, I have a lot to learn about these unfortunately introduced species. Yeah, that's a good question. And certainly the, the, perch, um, the perch issue at Nickel Lake is very concerning for everybody. Uh, I don't know the behavior well enough to suggest um, that they would compete for, for food. I'm sure the juveniles throughout their life history do, do compete with, uh, sorry, the perch would compete, compete with uh, juvenile burbot. Um, however, that being said, anecdotally, uh, we know of a case uh, recently where uh, burbot were actually introduced into a lake, uh, Jim Smith Lake in the Kootenays. And while they didn't, um, as far as I know, there's, there's, I'm not sure there's yellow perch in that lake, but other invasive species like that existed, the uh, burbot have done quite a good job at cleaning up the invasive species. And given they're such a, a predator, I would, I would expect the impacts of yellow perch and Nicholas system are probably more concerning uh, towards the monad than towards the burbot themselves. But again, I don't know for sure, uh, but I do expect burbot will probably eat uh, perch like they do other species of fish. Hopefully they do. Mm, interesting. Thanks for that, Adrian. Thanks for the question, Loretta. Um, Christian has a question um, directed to Willie. I'm curious about the impact of urban harvesting of invasive, non-invasive or non-native dye plants, in particular tansy and St. John's wort. Willie, can you, um, can you address that one? Yeah, good question. Um, so I know that there are different First Nations. Um, I read of a nation in Michigan that is harvesting invasives as part of a management plan. Um, and there's also a really strange restaurant in Florida that serves invasives. And I know that Japanese knotweed is actually on their menu. Um, I think the concern would more be if you're um, if you're growing invasives to harvest, um, that would be more concerning 
but if you're harvesting invasives um, as part as as in part of managing them, um, I think that would be fine. Great, thank you. All right, Murray. Murray's asking Adrian. You mentioned bleach as a disinfectant. Does the whirling disease reference include the protocols? When I was doing amphibian sampling, we used a bleach solution to disinfect gear. Yeah, it does. Um, and I believe the protocol is one part of bleach to 32 parts of 32 parts of water. Um, I think some people are hesitant to use the bleach solution on their gear because it can it can damage um, things like waders. Um, but uh, I think as long as you don't have too long of a contact time and, and rinse your gear off, it's, it's not as big of a concern, but certainly better than uh, potentially transmitting whirling disease. Mm. Adrian, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to um, um, uh, waders and, and felt sold waders, that whole issue. Um, that'd be great. Yeah, for sure. I, I think that uh, felt sold waders are, you know, from a safety perspective, I guess, in some situations, anglers or, or people working in the field uh, prefer them, but they're certainly an issue for transmitting um, organisms from one one, bottle, one water body to another. So I think if people are using felt soles, then they should they should really ensure they disinfect them as best they can. And that can be, you know, ensuring you dry them out in sunlight or using a, a bleach solution, um, or if you have some means to heat heat the uh, the sole to greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit in water, um, that would be another way to kill the kill the bug. Um, as long as you don't melt, melt your uh, food. Um. Great, thanks for that. Yeah, I know that they, they take a long time to dry out in my experience. So but some people think they just throw them in the sun for an hour or two and they should be okay. Yeah, we, our staff don't wear them at all anymore. Um, if, if they're in situations that are slippery, like rocky, then they, they go to those clamp on cleats. Um, to, they've, we've really gotten away from using salt soles. Interesting, all right. Um, one of the attendees is asking, why are these fish more susceptible to whirling disease? Do you know the answer to that? I, I don't, to be honest. I, I don't know why. Um, yeah, that's a, it's an interesting question versus other, uh, other species. All right, Brian Fix asking, I'm not sure if this is appropriate to this webinar, a single Japanese knotwood plant found in a creek bed. How would one go about removing it without causing spread? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, we have a lot of issues with knotweed everywhere. It's one of those super duper plants. And um, because it's in a creek bed, um, obviously no herbicide is allowed to be used on it. Uh, it's something that, uh, that uh, I'll put a, I'll get Brittany to put a link in the chat to our knotweed um, tip sheet, Brittany. Um, it is outside this webinar, but it's um, it's you know th there are some issues that uh, and and methods that you can use to to target that plant. So I'll I'll direct you to that. But thanks for your question. All right, checking out other questions in the chat or other questions in the um, uh, Q and A. Anyone has have anything more to, to uh, ask of Willie or Adrian? Oh, another one coming in. So Alan's asking, is it redundant to report invasives in municipal parks? Again, that's a little bit outside the uh, the the webinar, but actually not really. Um, not at all. Um, please use that report invasives app that Willie alluded to, and that the um, the link is in the chat. Um, I think it's important to report invasives no matter where they are. And uh, in, you, you know, some you, you would sort of think, oh, maybe municipal parks would people would know about it. But uh, um, I think you'd also be surprised that lots of people don't. So thanks for that. And thanks for Brittany. She's put the fact sheet on Knotweed, the link into, um, into the chat. There's lots of great information on our website on many of these species as well. All right, so I see no more questions in the Q&A or the chat. Um, I just really want to thank both Willie and Adrian for their great presentations and for their time today and for sharing your expertise with us on behalf of the council and on behalf of everybody that's listening. We'll be sending out a short link to an evaluation survey to everybody who's participating and please fill it out so we can get some feedback on this webinar and on future webinars. 
We've got some great webinars coming up, including one later this month on the 21st of October. It's, in called, it's entitled Impacts of Invasive Species in National Parks. And it's being put on by Peter Tarlington. And he's the invasive plant program lead for both Mount Revelstoke and Glacier National Parks. And he'll talk about how invasives impact native flora and fauna, and also some of the challenges of dealing with invasive species in national parks. Check the ISCBC website for more information on upcoming webinars and to register. And um, thanks again. Is there anything, uh, Adrian or Willie, that you want to say before we sign off? No, oh, just uh, thanks for attending, or thanks for coming, and thanks for attending. I've, I'm surprised at how many people signed sign on to these. It's great. All right. Yeah, just chi miigwech. Um, I'm definitely not a natural presenter, um, especially over Zoom. It can be really difficult when I can't see everyone. It feels like I'm talking to myself. So thank you for the great questions um, and being engaged. That was awesome. Thanks so much. All right. Well, thanks, folks. Wonderful to have uh, lots of people tuning in today, and uh, we'll see you next time. Have a great rest of the day.